Thanks everyone for joining us for this latest episode of the Green Left Show. Uh, as always, I'd like to acknowledge that we're recording this on stolen Aboriginal land. Sovereignty was never ceded and we uh, pay our ongoing um, respects to traditional owners and pledge our solidarity for ongoing struggles for justice. Today we're going to be talking about climate change in the lead up to the Conference of the Parties, the, the Glasgow Climate Summit in November, and also we've got the climate strike coming up this Friday. I'm here today with Will Steffen, who is a world leading climate um, expert. He's an emeritus professor at the Australian National University, and he's also a councillor with the Climate Council of Australia. Uh, before we get underway, I would like to point out that if you like the work we do, please become a supporter. It is the best way to show support for the work that we do and to receive the material that we produce. There are details below and plans start from just $5 a month. It makes a tremendous difference. Also, you could simply just give this video or this podcast a thumbs up, share the episode, help build the audience. That'll make a big difference as well. So I'd like to get into this discussion with, uh, with Will Steffen. Certainly the, uh, the area of Will's work that I'm most familiar with is the, the idea that there might be a series of cascading uh, climate tipping points that lead to the development of a hothouse earth. And I asked Will to begin by just uh, explaining what a climate tipping point is and what is this potential for the, you know, the hothouse earth development? Yeah, tipping points are um, processes or features of your system uh, where you can push them, put some stress on them, they change a bit, they change a bit, and they reach a critical point where a small increase in pressure can lead to an unexpectedly large response. Sometimes those responses are irreversible on time frames that are useful to us. Uh, sometimes you can cross a tipping point uh, and the system doesn't seem like it's changing any faster, but it reaches a point where you can't stop it from changing. I'll give you an example of the latter there, and that's the Arctic sea ice, which is the floating ice over the Arctic Ocean. And of course, uh, that is uh, retreating as the climate warms. So in the Northern Hemisphere summer, what that does is as that ice shrinks, it uncovers more dark ocean water that absorbs more sunlight, increases the heating, the ice shrinks a bit more. So it's shrinking a bit year by year, but it'll get to a critical point where um, we can stabilize global average temperature, but the fact that it's uncovering more darker ocean water every summer will continue the process and it will basically disappear. Um, it may not speed up a whole lot, but it will be irreversible. Um, Greenland ice sheets, another example is that it, it's melting from the top as well as losing some from its outlet glaciers. But as it melts from on top, it is lowering in elevation into warmer climatic zones. And it will reach a point where again, if we stabilize the climate, it'll just keep dropping until it virtually disappears. So these are a couple of examples of of what tipping points look like. Okay, and uh, I mean, I guess your your paper in 2018 sort of put forward this idea that there might be a, like, the one tipping point might lead to the next, one might lead to the next, and that could lead to a to a hot house earth. Can you explain that as well? Yeah, so ba basically um, you can look at them individually. Um, and I mentioned two of them. There are others in other parts of the world. Uh, coral reefs are another good example of a tip temperature tipping point. Um, and the Amazon forest, another good example. But the point is, is that they are all, uh, or many of them, I should say, not all of them, many of them are linked in various ways. And probably the best way to look at it is to start with uh, what we talked about before, um, which is the Arctic sea ice, because of course, as that shrinks, it is uncovering darker ocean water, as we mentioned, that's absorbing more sunlight during their summertime, which means it's increasing the heating regionally in the Northern high latitudes. That in turn is increasing the melt of the Greenland ice sheet. So here you see a connection between two tipping points. But what is Greenland doing? Well, it's, it's melting from on top, uh, which means it is pouring fresh water into the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, and that is uh, influencing the Atlantic Ocean circulation system. And we can already measure a slowdown in the North Atlantic uh, circulation system. Well, what does that do? Well, it actually changes rainfall patterns of continents next to the Atlantic Ocean. And it uh, has an effect all the way down toward the equator. Uh, and, and in fact, one of those effects is to reduce rainfall over the Amazon forest. And so when you do that and you combine it with direct human pressures, you get an increase in, in loss of that forest. And that may reach a critical tipping point and tip over. That's an example where four different tipping points 
Arctic sea ice, a Greenland ice sheet, Atlantic Ocean circulation, and Amazon rainforest are all connected. So we can start looking at these various connections. They don't form a neat uh, row of dominoes entirely, uh, but they are connected and so one can lead to another. So the concern is that there is a risk that if enough of these start tipping, the Earth system itself will move to a, an essentially different state. And that's how complex systems actually do transition from one state to another quite commonly. It's, it's usually a, a combination of factors that push them out of a stable state into an unstable trajectory until they settle down into another stable state. And that's the concern is that that, that is a risk uh, for the Earth system that I think we do need to take seriously. I think um, anyone with eyes to see can see that the climate crisis is a, a a big issue, like an important issue that that has got to be dealt with. I mean, you just look at the 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 series of uh, weather extremes in the northern summer that's just gone. Um, you know, now I, I was involved in a in a climate action group um, a bit over a decade ago called Safe Climate, and even then there were people saying, "Oh, safe climate is gone. We've 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 left the Holocene. The safe climate is gone." But this idea of, I guess crossing that planetary threshold that you spoke about or, or and as i understand you've described this hothouse earth to me it feels like that is the job of humanity at the moment is to try and make sure we avoid crossing that planetary threshold so i guess i mean firstly in, in australia climate politics is so so backward i mean um people are talking about net zero 2050 as as if that's some you know major uh threshold that the government might um might cross um, so I guess, I mean, firstly, is it even possible for us to avoid crossing that planetary threshold? And if so, does, does the net zero 2050 cut it? Uh, well, certainly I'll start with the back, with back end of that question first. No, net zero by 2050 won't cut it. That's far too late. Uh, we have to act with much more urgency than that. How close are we to a, a global um, tipping point? In other words, initiating some sort of uh, cascade? Uh, we don't know. Uh, and, that's, and we probably never will know. Uh, and the best quote uh, I can give you is a, a colleague and good friend of mine named Carlos Nobre, who's former head of the World Climate Research Program. So he's a pretty heavyweight guy in terms of the climate system. He's a Brazilian and his area of expertise is the Amazon rainforest. And so you, a lot of people ask him a question. He is really the world's expert on this. How close are we to a tipping point of the Amazon forest? And his answer is, well, I can't tell you for sure. I think we're closer than we suspect we are, but he said where that tipping point precisely lies, the only way we'll know that for sure is by tipping it. And then he said, and that's not a very intelligent thing to do. So that's that's the point I make is we, we will never know for sure uh, where a potential tipping cascade will be initiated, at what level of human pressure. And it will probably be a combination of, of climatic pressure plus some local pressures on forests and so on. Um, we'll only know after we've after we've tipped it and we see that it's that it's underway and then it's too late. So you really need to take a risk analysis. And I think the the IPCC sixth assessment report was actually quite good in the summary for policymakers by putting some real high end risks in there. For example, you know, a 15 meter sea level rise by 2300. Um, that's a huge sea level rise by 2300. Uh, but they said we can't rule it out. And so that 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 terminology, the, the terminology they used, which was, there are some things we can't rule out. We think they're low probability, but they're extremely high impact and we can't rule them out. So you better take them seriously when you do a risk analysis. And I think that's the appropriate way to look at a tipping cascade, hothouse earth. We can't rule it out. The earth has been four or five degrees hotter in the past. We know it can exist in that state, but we don't know for sure where we might trigger such a, a transition, a tipping cascade. So the risk analysis says, stay away from any potential tipping point as far as you can to safeguard the future. That's that's the approach you need to take. Okay, thanks for that. I mean, so then I guess getting back to current policies, because we're in the lead up to the, the conference of the parties in Glasgow next month, uh, a lot of countries have put a, you know, more ambitious climate policies than Australia. Uh, so I think we've got you know, Joe Biden on, um, 50% by 2030, the European Commission is saying 55%. Uh, Boris Johnson's got a 78% reduction from a different starting point by 2035. So, I mean, these these uh, other countries are uh, far in advance of Australia. Um, what would you say, I mean, even the Business Council of Australia has come out this last weekend saying 46% for Australia. Um, so obviously Australia could, could be doing a lot more, but 
are the are the kinds of figures that those other countries talking about are they enough? Or, you know, or, or I guess to put it in your language, is that a is that an adequate response to the risk assessment? Well, I think it's it's certainly pointing us in the right direction, and and it is reducing the risk. Um, I think what we need to do globally is to cut emissions at least by 50% by 2030. That's a minimum. And we should aim for better. Uh, and we should hit re reach net zero by 2040, not 2050. And again, that's the, the minimum. If we can do it a, bit, a few years before that, the better. When you look at the so-called carbon budget for a trajectory like that, um, you will get close. We'll probably get close to 1.5. We won't get there. I think that's uh, we, we've left it too late, but we will keep temperature rise, hopefully, to well below two. That's 1.7, 1 1.8. Uh, that's not altogether safe, uh, but, but uh, we've pretty serious impacts. But at least from where we sit today in 2021, that will, I think, minimize the risk. It will totally eliminate the risk that we still might initiate a tipping cascade, even with that scenario. But we have a much higher risk of really bad outcomes if we stick with a net zero by 2050 and a weak 2030 target. So that's the point I would make is, is net zero by 2050. I think that's sort of a cop out. It's easy to say it's kicking the can down the road. Um, we really need to look very carefully what countries are pledging by 2030 and when they really um, need to hit net zero. And it's got to be uh, well before 2050. I wanted to turn to, I guess, what I've got in my notes here as the uh, bright siding versus uh, alarmism debate. Uh, I think we've seen, I mean, uh, people like Michael Mann have pointed out, I think very correctly, that um, the doomism today is the new denialism. Like there's a sort of a, a sense of, oh, it's just, doom is just all too great. Um, and that is, you know, we, we can't do anything and it basically, you know, uh, leads to a sort of a, to a stifling of action. Um, so doomism today is the new denialism. I think that's, I think that's totally fair enough. On the other hand, I've uh, I've heard some people, uh, both science, uh, climate scientists and science communicators, talking about this sort of thing. Oh, we're on this sort of climate heating global superhighway. We're aiming for the 1.5 exit. If we don't make the 1.5 exit, well, then we go for you know two. Or if we miss two, then we go for 2.5. Um, I mean, I, I guess at a certain point, that I mean, well, obviously that's true. Obviously, we've got to, we've got to take the exit as soon as we possibly can. Um, but surely there is a danger. Uh, if we leave it too long. So I guess, um, can you, I guess, yeah, explain what your thoughts are on this sort of, you know, doomism versus um, denialism or bright siding versus alarmism. Uh, where would you sort of, um, what, 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 what would be your response to that discussion? Uh, my response is, is probably different from most people. And that comes from more of my personal background than um, any really expert understanding of of doomism or alarmism versus bright, whatever they call it, sunshine pumping is what I would call it. But anyway, and that's because um, one of my activities until I got a bit too old was uh, climbing and mountaineering, uh, which is a dangerous activity. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and the danger is it right in front of you. Uh, and, and my view there, particularly on, on high altitude mountaineering, uh, where, where there are a lot of um, what we call objective dangers, uh, you can't control them. They're there in terms of crevasses, in terms of weather shifts and so on, that you absolutely have to understand risks as clearly, as clearly as you possibly can, uh, which then makes it much easier for you to take the most appropriate action to minimize risk. So uh, where I, I, I might, I'm, I'm not sure about exactly what Michael means about, about denialism or alarmism. I think we need to understand risk really clearly. And that means we don't need to, we shouldn't sugarcoat it because that's going to lead to poor decisions. On the other hand, we need to say, all right, things look really bad. There's some really big risks out here, but you have to take the next step. Say, all right, as a climber, what are the actions you take to minimize those risks? Where do you really turn back on a climb? Where do you say, I think the risks are manageable? Um, the reason I'm still here at age 74 is I think I made the right decisions uh, in several situations where I could have lost my life. Let's put it that way. So um, that's the way we need to think is we need to be absolutely clear minded uh, about what these risks really are. And we need to have the best science to understand them. We shouldn't deny them or sugarcoat them or try to push them in the background. But we have to take the next step of empower people to say, this looks pretty bad. What do we do to get the best possible outcome we can from here on out? 
So, so what I'm saying now is that what we're saying is that 1.5 is virtually gone without an overshoot and drawdown, but well below two is not. And there's a huge difference that, that every tenth of a degree is really important. Um, so that means there's an enormous amount to gain. Uh, there's an enormous amount we can still avoid. Um, but but the clear the clear eyed view is we can't go back and pat ourselves on the back and say, whoo, we, avoid, we avoided a lot there. We haven't yet. We have to act. And that's the second point I make is how do you get people optimistic? You don't do it by telling them good news or sunshine pumping. You do it by acting. <laughs> that's how you solve a big climate, uh, you know, a big climbing problem is you act. <laughs> You know, you act um, with the best uh, understanding, with the best um, skills you've got, and with timing. You've got to do all that and trust your, your climbing mates. So, and we've got to do this with climate. We've, we've got to act with the best we know. We've got to act vigorously, fast, with determination, and consistently. Um, and that's where governments have let us down. But we as citizens really need to push the buggers to say, look, our future depends on this. You can't fiddle around with short-term politics. We need to move on this now. Those are the sort of messages that science needs to make. And I think we are making pretty well now. I think there, is been a, there has been a shift from a lot of scientists speaking out more, more, more vocally on climate. Is that your assessment as well? Absolutely. No, I think that's very good. And we see shifts even in the IPCC. Look at the, um, uh, science, um, uh, the this, um, summary for policymakers, SPM. Uh, the wording in that is quite different from earlier ones. I mean, it's absolutely straight down the, the you know, the, the, the science is absolutely there, rock solid science, but the risk analysis is very clear now in that report, which I think is a, something that we are obliged to do as scientists is, is to put it on the table in terms of what the risk risks really look like. All right, well, I guess to, to finish up, I mean, we, we've got the COP coming up, as I mentioned, we also got this Friday, the climate strike, um, at least happening online or in, in person in different parts of Australia. So I think that is, uh, you know, some of the most inspiring action we've seen in, in recent years. I wonder if you want to make any comments about about that um, or and also, I guess, if there's anything else more specifically you wanted to say about policy directions that you would advocate um, in Australia. Yeah, look, uh, obviously, our, our policies are far, far too weak. Everybody knows that. Um, and I think we're pretty, pretty sure now that there are some fairly interesting discussions and arguments going on within the coalition at the moment uh, on, on what we need to do uh, going into Glasgow. Time is running out for them. Uh, but I think there are a couple of things. Obviously, perhaps ScoMo will come with a net zero by 2050. I, I think he probably, he probably would like to do that. Um, uh, that's the absolute bare minimum. I think the real focus here needs to be on what do we do by 2030? Uh, we've got to make that really, really clear. And the second point is, um, and this follows on not from a bunch of greenies or scientists, it follows from the International Energy Agency, is that we have to stop uh, investment in new fossil fuel projects of any kind, coal, oil, or gas. Uh, and I think the IEA is pointing the finger mostly at Australia uh, and that we need to stop this. We can't hide behind the fact that, well, if we export it, it's somebody else's problem. No, it's our problem because we actually have control over those deposits of fossil fuels. We can choose not to exploit them and we can choose to develop renewables instead. Um, so that's within our, our remit and that's what we need to do. So I would like to see a focus on two things. One is at least 50% uh, reduction by 2030. I would like to see it much higher. We in the Climate Council are re reckoning that 75%, it's a challenge, but it's achievable. And that's what we should aim. We should aim high. But really importantly, we should absolutely put the brakes on fossil fuel development. No more, full stop. Just stop it all now. That's what we need to do. Yeah, actually, well, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I guess from, uh, I mean, I'm coming from this as a, as a political activist and at the radical end of the, of the political spectrum, and I think a lot of people make judgments about what they advocate based on assumptions about what is politically possible. And I guess I feel like climate change is, is the issue about which we need to shift everything on its head and, um, and basically go all out as fast as we can. Are there, are there any final comments you want to make before we finish up? Yeah, just to follow on from your last comment about politics. Uh, the laws of physics don't pay any attention to politics. This planet operates on the laws of physics, chemistry, and so on, on natural sciences. Uh, we're giving advice based on the best science, 
Uh, politics better listen to this because the natural world doesn't compromise like politicians do. Uh, and that's my, my last word. Okay, thanks for that, Will. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as always, if you like our work, please do become a supporter. It does make a really big difference. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us.